Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Ben, and in this episode of the Smoking Hot Confessions Barbecue Podcast, we're chatting with two-time world barbecue champion and founder of Butcher Barbecue, David Busker. This is the internationally awarded Smoking Hot Confessions Barbecue Podcast with your host, Ben Arnott. How long has it been since your last confession? David, welcome to the confessional, my friend. I do apologize. I did ask you right before we started the correct pronunciation of your surname, and then I went ahead and I messed it up. Of course, it's David Boscat, not Busca. I apologize. Oh, that's all right, Ben. I'm I'm honored to be in the confessional. <laughs> Look, mate, um, one thing that I always ask everybody when I kick things off is what was the last thing that you barbecued? Now, you obviously barbecue a lot. So I'm going to say what was the last thing that you barbecued just because you wanted to eat it? So just for the for the fun of it. We were actually did a Wagyu brisket. Um, so that, that was it over the weekend. Oh, nice. OK. Was that a, uh, a snake snake river? No, sir. Um, I actually cook the A9 briskets right there from Australia. Oh, right. Okay. What, uh, what, what, what brand is that? Um, I get them out of a plant out, or I mean a retail store out of Florida Oklahoma, or United States. And I, I'll be honest with you. I don't remember the actual brand that they bring in, but um, it is an Australian uh, beef that I cook. Okay. Yeah. That that's interesting. I was at, um, Hammond barbecue challenge back when we could still travel and uh I was talking to uh to one of the people there I think it was uh Byron and um he took me into his trailer and said oh hey I've got this Australian brisket and he showed it to me and I'd actually never heard of it before so I think the I think the US market probably gets first dibs on all our exports and uh because I've I, I wasn't actually aware that we actually had our own a9 wave you here in Australia <laughs> Yeah, I did a class down at Byron's um, Ranch here in the United States, and man, I tell you what, that is a great man to to work with. So, he's very fun, isn't he? Yes, he is. Yeah. So, tell me about this uh, this wagyu brisket. How do you like to do a wagyu brisket? Um, I've I've kind of straddled the fence on hot and fast, low and slow. I mean, hey, I am a pellet cooker. That's what's made my fame is I've done nothing but cook on pellets. We've won all of our contests on pellets. I've played around a little bit with the drums, but I am, I'm a pellet cooker. So I, I started out the old low and slow, put them on, let them cook overnight. Um, but recently, I say recently, probably the last four years, I've been cooking um, them hot and fast in a pellet grill. And I'm talking start to finish to about five and a half hours. Wow. What temperature are you running the, the pellet cooker at that uh, to get that kind of temp, uh, time? Two temperatures, uh, 260 degrees and 280 degrees. We, we step it up throughout the cook. Okay. All right. That, that's interesting. I, I usually cook everything at 275 and I can't get my briskets to go in five and a half, six hours. It's all about airflow and the pellet grill that I'm cooking is an extremely heavy airflow pellet grill. The air comes in from the top, not from the bottom. So whenever you're cooking that brisket, um, I'm telling you the air is hitting directly on the top surface of that meat. So it's not coming in from the sides or anything. So that has really assisted in that. Oh, right. Okay. And what type of pellet grill is that? It's like a GMG Traeger? No, it's called a PG 500. It's a pellet grill 500. It's made, it's a fast eddies by cook shack. Oh, cook okay. shack is the brand. Yep, yeah. yep. 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 I saw a bunch of them when I was over there. They look like a good bit of gear. It is a great piece of equipment. I've been cooking on that particular one. I would guess probably eight years. Okay. Wow. So you, yeah. you know it inside out and backwards. Well, I've dropped it a few times on my toes. <laughs> it's, uh, it's probably still better to drop on your toes than a 250-pound uh, uh, offset. Yeah, no doubt about that. <laughs> so let's, let's jump in the time machine and let's go back to the start. Tell us how you, you first got into barbecue. 
Well, it was kind of just due to me being a guy. I shot competition archery and I blew my back out. I'd have had a um, two or three back surgeries, but back in the early um, 2000s is when I had all my back issues and I was still running my meat plant. Um, I'd been 34 years in the meat business and that's, I kind of felt like I knew the meat, but I found an article in a local paper that was going over, hey, we got a local barbecue contest. And I was like, wow, that intrigues me because I kind of figured maybe I'd step in equal with some people, but never thought I'd come out ahead of anybody. So just knowing what I knew about the meat world and how meat cooks and, and all that and using smokers in our meat plant, I, I kind of thought I'd be okay. So my wife and I went up to it and we walked around. I took notes, um, met a few people there. And about 45 days later, I was entering my first contest. Right. Okay. And how did you go in that first contest? Uh, seems like it was around, there was about 35 contestants and I was like 14th, 15th. And that's about what I expected. Um, like I said, I didn't figure I'd come in hot scotch. I, I got ninth or 10th place in chicken. And I thought I ruled the world, you know, all the way home. That's all I could talk about. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> I was going to say that was my fame for the, till the next contest. I think that first year we did four, five, six contests and, and I was hooked, man. I fell in love with it. And the reason I guess I liked it so much is coming out of archery, those old male competitive juices of having to win at something was still still th flowing in my blood and and I had to win. So that's how it kind of got started. That's so cool. And amazing that you uh finished like 14th or 15th or in your in your first ever competition that to to come straight out of the gate and finish that high in the field is a is a really remarkable achievement. My first competition I came second last. <laughs> Resoundingly second hey, last. Was it wasn't last. Keep telling yourself that. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Now, did I see that you actually um, had another crack at competition archery just recently? Yeah, I, I actually fell back in love with it. And after several years, like just a lot of time off, um, I got back into it and yes, I've been, I've been traveling and shooting again in the, the winter time here. So I get to still go do some competitions in the summer. And then I, 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 shoot competition archery in the winter now oh right oh, okay and is there any crossover there do you go bow hunting and then bring the bring the beasts home and uh break them down and smoke them up now i feel no need to to go sit in the woods or, or go hunt i've done it i don't get nothing out of it um i've skinned a few thousand deer or the meat plant in the past and okay no i got enough i get nothing out of it i I got enough ribs and briskets and, and hamburger meat. Um, so no, I don't hunt. Yeah, fair enough. I can see how if that's your if that's your day job, I can see why you wouldn't want to be uh doing that on the weekends as well. Um, okay, well that's cool. I um I I actually used to shoot uh archery when I was a teenager, so that's a funny crossover there. Uh, I, I want to uh, just loop back to what you mentioned before. You had uh thirty four years experience in a in a meat market. Now, meat market means something very different over here in Australia. So I'm just curious, um, what's the difference between a meat market and a butcher shop? Okay. Actually, I did it all. Um, we still, my meat plant, we still went out to the farms and harvested the animals, the beef and the pork there, would skin them, gut them, bring them back in our, um, our refrigerator trucks, and then hang them up in our plant. And then we would let them age. And then I would cut it to the specific, pardon me, the specific way that the farmer wanted it. Then we would vacuum pack it, freeze it and um, tell them, come get it. But then I also done 20 years or so in retail. So I've worked in the grocery stores too, for a long time. Oh, okay. All right. Interesting. So it's almost like a, a meat market is almost like an abattoir, is that a fair a fair assumption? I'm not sure what that is, so you'd make me lie if I said something. Okay, all right, all right. That that might be a uh, Australia US uh, uh, difference in um, terms. Okay, so uh, okay, let's get back to to, to competition barbecue then. Um, how long was it before you sort of got good? You mentioned that that your first one was 
you came in around 14th. When was it that you started winning? Because I know that you've won a lot. <laughs> we Our first contest was in 06, 2006. In the sp- spring, summer of 2007, we won our first grand champion. Um, it was probably our 10th or 12th contest um, that I had competed in, and we had won that one. It was smaller one. It was probably only about 25 teams in it. Um, hung our head high, went to the next one, and I think I reserved the next one. So from that point forward, we just kept rolling. Yeah. Yeah, very nice. And so you sort of built up a reputation from there and, and sort of kept kept traveling around. Now, I, I did read that you had won several hundred grand champions. Is that right? Yeah, we've, we've won a bunch. <laughs> Um, we've had the automatic bids into the Jack for winning. You got to win a minimum of seven to get the auto. And we've, we've done that. Um, we've won. Oh, I would have to go back and guess in 12 or 14 different States across the United States. We've won and there are different States for their state championships. So yeah, yeah, we've, we've enjoyed it. I'm just, I, I say it all the time. It's just absolutely amazing to me what barbecue has brought to me to my family, to my brother. He travels with me. Um, so it's just absolutely amazing how much barbecue is brought to us and the fellowship we've been able to get out of it. Yeah, it's amazing how people are able to bring their families into it as well. There's not many other competitive sports out there that's as family-oriented and, and family-friendly as barbecue. I was reading about your your brother online on your website here, and he's actually um, sort of splintered off and opened his own barbecue joint. Is that right? Oh, that's my son. My son done that. Oh, that's your yes. son. Um, okay. Yeah. My, my brother, um, he was in the first uh, series of the Barbecue Pitmaster shows where we went, we, um, competed doing the whole hog. He was in that series with me. And then my son went with me. Um, a couple of years later when we were invited to go do the barbecue um, pit masters, all stars. So he was in that series with me. Oh, okay. Yeah. I've, I've got that noted down here as well. So tell us a bit about barbecue pit masters. How did that opportunity come about? They called me actually, we was driving um, in my truck and they called and I had thought about putting in for it, but now the deadline had passed and I didn't think much of it. And one of the producers was calling to ask me if I'd be interested. They'd been given our name from somebody I don't know. And I actually thought it was a friend of mine pulling a joke on me. And I, I told him, I says, Hey, Donnie, I said, I'm sorry, dude. I says, I got you. I said, I, I know who this is. And he's like, Oh no, sir. I said, I'm so, and I'm like, what really? <laughs> and, well, and, and then it just kind of went from there. He, uh, I asked what all will it entail and everything. And, he told me, he says, but we're real shorthanded or real short time said, we need you in Florida in like 20 days. And I'm like, oh, well, that's short. And I, he said, well, I said, what do you need? And they mailed me a camera and I had to do some home cooking for them to have on the camera while we're, I guess, introducing us and things like that. And 20 or 21 days later, we were down in Florida cooking for the first TV show. Wow. And so what does that, um, what's that process like? Is that like, do they shoot the whole episode in like one day or does it sort of stretch over a couple of days or? It's, it's actually very long and grueling. Um, and it is as true as what you see, except for just a few minor things. We don't know what we're going to cook. Um, and the only time that you, that there's a change in the, in the format is, if they give you a long cook, like we had been given brisket or a pork butt, they give that to us the day before and they're not there to mess up your process of the way you cook. Cause not everybody cooks the same. Some cook slow, some cook fast. And so they still want the best food turned in. So we just, for example, I don't remember the exact days we showed up, but let's say like this one, let's say we show up on a Wednesday, they'll give us the big meat. Um, the everybody's given a producer and a camera person and the producer will take notes the whole time, um, writing down stuff. And so we'll get that, get it in cooking whenever 
they tell us we're allowed to. Generally, it was later in the evening. Um, and then the next day, they'll just say, hey, be on set at 6.30 in the morning. Um, we're going to start all over. So they get that ice chest in front of you. You see, we all do. And we know what one meat is. We know that. But we don't know what the second one is. And generally, that's a short cook. So they always call it the faux meat. And so we get there. We open it up. And we're like, oh, a pork butt. Oh, I'm so surprised. And then you look over and go, oh, spare ribs. Okay, yeah. Now we got to put our game face on for ribs. That's what we did down there. It was actually pork butts and spare ribs. So in front of the camera, you reprep this faux pork butt for the camera, even though you got one cooking. Yeah. Um, and then you do your ribs, and then you go through your process, and they'll tell you there's a hard deadline, a hard deadline. It's, say, 5 o'clock that evening. All turn-ins have to be done. And you, you're you wired, you're mic'd up the whole time. You you can't do anything. And if you need to do something, you got to tell your producer, and they'll have the camera guy there ready. And the hard, grueling thing for us as a cook is, you know, we're generally open your smoker, get out of it, close it, let it come back to heat. Well, they might want four or five different angles of doing that same thing. So you'd open it up, take the ribs out, close the door. Okay, now they're going to go stand on the other side of you. So you got to put it back in, shut the door, open it back up. They're going to film it again, pull it out, shut the door. Okay, now we're going to come where we're kind of on top of you doing it. So you put it back in. Oh, it's it's a pain in the rear to, to do it, but they really want, they're trying to capture everything possible, okay? And then all that interview you see to where, like, they say, well, what ribs? Tell us about the ribs. What did you think of the um, ice chest when you opened it? Well, all of those questions and answers are done the next day. So you got to turn around after everything and relive it. And the producer's job is to put you in that mindset. Okay, now think back. What were you thinking just before you opened that ice chest? And so you have to present it as if you're talking to them live. And it's more like, all right. all right, let's see, how would it be said? It'd be, as I look down at the ice chest, I'm really curious, and I hope that it's not barbecue goat we got to cook, or you got to come up with something. Um, they're not there to make you the bad guy or to put words in your mouth, but let's be real. It is TV, and they want to sensationalize it. They need so to be they, some they drama, yeah. To, that's right. They try to poke you to get you to say things to the other cooks and stuff like that. But um, they actually, it's, it's, it's a game show. Here in the United States, all game shows are governed by the government. Um, and if you, um, it's very regulated, extremely regulated. Because back in the 60s, um, there was some cheating on a game show and it cost thousands and thousands of dollars. Well, now the government will levy a $1 million fine on anybody that releases anything about the episode of a game show. Because you, let's be real, everybody likes to bet on everything. Sports, ah. race cars, and they bet on anything. They'll bet on game shows. So if, you, if they can track that the release or, or the outcome come from you, you can be in deep trouble. I mean, we had to meet in a hotel before all the filming and met with a third party company that regulated the rules that was set forth to us so that, wow. um, yeah, it was, it's a big deal so that all the rules are followed by the, by the, uh, uh producers and by us so that everything is followed to the T. Yeah. And there was one show, I actually had an incident that I had to call him over because there was a problem with something. Um, let's see, it was, I think this, it was that first show. It was that first show we did in Florida. As we turned in the food, we turned in. And as I'm going around the back of the bus that they had us, I noticed they were extremely quick. They were starting to change the stage to where the judges could get out there and start judging the food while we sat around back. Well, I noticed that the Cambro that they used to hold the uh, boxes in, the stage crew 
as he grabbed it and lifted it over, he caught the bottom of it on the table and it went sideways. Oh, well, yeah. If you're in the bottom, you went like this, but if you was in the top, you went completely sideways. So as I got around back, I more, I thought about it. You're still mic'd up. So I called my producer and it was a, uh, a lady and I don't remember her name, but we'll say Susan. So I said, Hey, Susan, I have got a question and a real concern about the judging process. Well, she came around back and she got me. She said, let's step over here and step away from everybody. And I explained what I had visually seen. And she says, okay, go ahead and go sit back down. And I went over and sat down, back down by the other guys and everything. And about 10 minutes later, here come this little, little, little dude that we met in the hotel. He'd been there the whole time, but I hadn't seen him. Here he come. He says, I understand that um, you have an issue with the judging. And the other two guys pop up, go, oh, crud, what's, what's going on? And so he pulled me back out, and I explained to him what I seen. And um, he's like, okay. We went back over in front of everybody, and he explained. He said, okay, guys, and he explained to them what I had visually seen and said that since the boxes are going to be messed up, he will instruct the judges to not judge on appearance of the way it's setting in the box, but judge it on the way the meat looks like it's been cooked. We all three agreed that that was, that was fair, which it worked out because of the young man or the man that came from California, his was on top and his ribs was rolled all around inside the box. It was wow. terrible. And TV being what TV is, they actually um, voiced over him and said, oh, boy, that looks good. Let me tell you, that is not what he said. <laughs> <laughs> I would imagine but, not. Yeah, but the TV show's real. It, it's actually happening in the real times. Yeah. Okay, interesting. I, I have actually always noticed that um, – because I'm an English language teacher during the day, I have actually noticed that when they are filming those little, uh, the, the, those afterthoughts that you were talking about where you have to, where you have to talk through what you were thinking, I have actually noticed that they keep using present tense grammar, even though it's clearly, the, the conversation they're having is clearly right. after the event. That is absolutely right. Um, good pickup on that. And let me tell you, it's, it, that, that, those interviews can last seven to 10 hours. They're grueling, very grueling. And really, there'd be a couple. Yes. Yes. Those folks can sit out there and they'll have those big shaded things that you see them using to reflect lights. And I've walked out of there sunburned um, with the way they shade the light, because when they start at say seven or eight in the morning, by the time they're getting to five, six, seven o'clock at night, there's trying to capture all the sunlight to where you don't realize that it's a different time of the day. Yeah. And I'm going to tell you what, um, I'm just a country boy from Oklahoma. I ain't made for that stuff. <laughs> so is that, is that a full day just for you or is that all the competitors and they do all those, all those reflections? All three of us are going in different. The, the, the next day, like I said, the, um, the third day that we're doing all those, is the first day that the next group is setting up. Okay. See? So they don't need the camera guys while they're setting up and cooking their faux meat. They don't need them. So the camera guy, you see where I'm going? Yeah. So it is a third day for us, but it's a first day for another group getting ready to start cooking. Yeah. So you're not even necessarily all cooking your food at the same time. Um, if it's a different uh, episode, it's a different cook. Now. The three of us that was on the show, yes, we're cooking together. Yes, all at the same oh, time. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, we're talking like a whole different episode of a show. They 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 cook the at the next three days or something. Yeah. Yep. 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 Gotcha. Okay. I I didn't realize that. I thought um that they just focused on one episode at a time, but of course that would make sense that you'd stack the episodes. Yeah. Well, especially um, that was done mostly with the all-star shows that way, the crew, the, everybody was in one spot and we traveled in and out, but all the cost of traveling with all the equipment, it never had to move. Mm. Yeah. That sounds much more efficient than what I was thinking. Much better. Okay. Now I, I want to move on um, just before we jump into segment two, 
you won Memphis in May in 2012 and then again in 2018. That's a huge achievement. Two-time world barbecue champion. In, Sorry? Incorrect. Uh, let me correct you. In okay. 2012, we won the World Food Championships. Oh, okay. That was in, yeah, that was in Las Vegas, Nevada, uh-huh. out in Las Vegas. And in 2018, we won the Jack Daniels World Championship. Ah, oh, okay. All right. My apologies. I, I I totally misread that altogether then. Oh, yeah. I just wanted to clear the air for everybody to know. So tell us about the, the World Food Championships. I'll be honest with you. That was a whirlwind. It was a little different type contest. Sauce actually counted for the overall, um, but they did not cook chicken, I think it was. I don't think they cooked chicken. Um, so sauce was the fourth category in there the weekend before we were actually in Lynchburg, Tennessee, cooking the Jack for 2012. We got back to my home state in Oklahoma, which is about an eight hour drive. And I cleaned up and trimmed meat, and got everything ready. Monday morning, my brother took my truck and trailer and they headed out to Las Vegas, which is a almost a 24 hour drive. I stayed home, took care of some other stuff, and I flew out like on Wednesday or Thursday, picked me up. We cooked the contest, and then I flew home, and they drove the truck and trailer back home. (laughs) That's a great deal. That sounds like a better way of doing it to me. (laughs) So good, so good. And then um, it was the, the Jack in 2018. Tell us about the Jack. Yes. It was surreal. Um. The team that got reserved was Iowa Smokey D's, Darren Worth. The month before we cooked the American Royal, I reserved it and he won it. Uh He beat me by, yeah, he beat me by three quarters of a point. And then at the Jack, I beat him by three quarters of a point. No. Yes. Yes. (laughs) So it was coincidental. Yes, absolutely. But. Um, I, I bring that up every now and then to different people and they always are talking about the judges. There's such inconsistency in the judging. And I'm like, guys, look at it. 30 days apart, three States apart. Look at this. So yeah, it was a coincidence, but they don't need to know about that. Yeah. I just got something to show them. <laughs> yeah. Mate, that's an incredible story. That's so good. Look, we're going to just uh, pause here for a minute. Have a quick, uh, have a quick break and we'll be right back. Got a project you'd like to work on with the SHC team? Shoot Ben an email on ben at smokinghotconfessions.com and let's have a conversation. All righty, David, it's it's great to be back. And uh, what I want to dive into now is the business side of what you do. So you you do, of course, have a Butcher Barbecue, which I assume was your competitive team name as well, and you carried over into the business? Yes, that is correct. Awesome. Now. One thing that I did find incredible when I was looking at your website, I'm actually going to bring a picture of this up on the screen here. Um, For the listeners who are listening into the audio version, I've just brought up a map um, of the uh, continental United States and it shows all the different shop locations that, uh, that butcher barbecue products are available in. And mate, that is incredible. I don't think there's a single state in the United States that you don't have a presence in. Is that right? I would I would be hard to press to to find one yes and there's a there's probably another I would guess 80 or 90 stores not listed because I do have another distributor and I don't know who they distribute to and the same thing up in Canada I do, I've got a major distributor up there I have no idea who they distribute to um so yeah there's there's more I can add but I just don't have the opportunity or the um, or the chance to do that because they're not going to give me a list of their customers. Yeah, fair enough. I understand that. I, I figured that was probably the situation when I scrolled the map over to Australia and I saw there was one shop in Australia and I thought, I'm sure that's not right. I'm sure I've seen Butcher Barbecue in a bunch of different shops over here. Yeah, we've got some there. We've got some in New Zealand also. And we've also got a distributor in the UK that we've been working with. So, Yeah, really good. Honored, absolutely thrilled that 
folks want to want to use it, um, want to buy it. Um, I'm just appreciative all the, all the time. Just it just amazes me. Yeah, yeah. Now is that is that a stockist way down the bottom of the map there in Nicaragua? Yes, that is correct. <laughs> wow. That's yeah. awesome. I I wouldn't have thought that there would have been a a, a, a sort of a competitive barbecue scene there. I, I I would have thought they would have had their own sort of style that uh, that Southern American or, or or Central American barbecue. It's a Weber Smoky Mountain Grill um, retail store, and they brought our stuff into the store. Yeah, so good. That's so good. You're bringing it into uh, into Nicaragua. That's fantastic. I would not have picked that at all. So tell me, um, in your in your competition barbecue journey, when did you decide to turn the team into a business? When was that? Um, when you made that that decision, okay, we're we're going to really go with this. In two thousand six, our first contest, I did use injections in all the stuff that I cook. In two thousand seven, I started transforming it over to more of what we have now. At the end of 2007, after we started winning, I had teams calling me going, hey, I'd kind of like to have an idea. Would you be? Would you make me some? Would you sell me some? And in 2008, we actually started selling it. And actually, it was 2007. I take that back. In 2007, we started selling it. Yeah. That's really soon after you got started in, in competition barbecue. Yeah. Um, and I think it was because there was a market for it. I really do. Um, and I still had the meat plant. We were still processing meat and everything and did that full time. And I really him hawed around and there for a couple of years, I, I kind of think that the barbecue carried the meat market there for a while. There was that much business in that versus the meat market. Yeah. And in, let's see, it was probably eight years ago, maybe nine years ago, I decided to um, do it full time. And six years, be seven years ago now, I completely closed the meat shop down and just done, do nothing but barbecue. God, that's the dream, isn't it? Just to be able to do barbecue work full time. Well, you better watch what you wish for because it is a job. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, I, I, I don't doubt that for a second. Yeah. The, the <laughs> second that you turn, turn something into a job, it becomes a job. That's right. Yeah. So what was the uh, what was the first product then? Because you've you've got your uh, your injection line, which was how I first came across Butcher Barbecue. Um, what was the first product in the in the lineup? It was actually two of them right at the same time. Our premium rub and our honey rub was the first two items that hit the market, and within probably forty five days, our br- original brisket injection hit the market. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So you sort of hit the ground running there with almost three products straight out of the gate. Yeah. So what, yeah. what by the end of that, I was going to say by the end of that year, we had the pork injection also. So we had four items at the end of the first year. And, and I actually kept asking myself, Oh my gosh, how am I ever going to stay up with this? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What, how do you adapt your competition game? when you're winning, 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 and then you're selling the products that you're using to win to other people. And so then and now other people are using the same things that you've been using to win. Does that make sense? How do you, how do you adapt that to stay on top? Well, it, it all comes back to being a cook. Uh, I call it being a pit master. The more circumstances you've been in, the more you know what to do, okay? I am all about teaching everybody everything I know, okay? After that, I've just got to cook better than them. If if they cook better than me, I just need to do more practicing. But I have no problems at all teaching people what I do, when I do, how I do, what I put on it, everything. I have no problems with that at all. I just feel that my process is so repeatable that I can do the same thing. I, this coming weekend is my first contest since November of last year. I have no problem. I haven't done any real test cooking on competition stuff. I'm just going to go out and follow my process. Fair enough. Do you do you cook much competition stuff at home or do you prefer to just keep it simple at home? Actually, if I'm cooking at home, there's some something about it is I, I wanna I wanna test something. Either it's the timing 
um, a rub, um, may, maybe it's the the meat that I bought, something. And so I'm always testing testing with the family. They may not know it, but I am. <laughs> awesome, nice. I love that. Now, what 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 was the growth journey like for for Butcher Barbecue? I mean, we we just looked at the map with you know hundreds and hundreds of locations. Tell us about that that journey. Wow. I can still remember the very first store I ever got it in. It was an online store and I actually was talking with them about two weeks ago and told them they were the first one and they, they didn't realize that. Um, and I remember, I guess it was the injections that really helped me. Um, I had a couple of really pretty big names that helped me get, get the injection going and to help me test with it. Um, don't want to name drop, but, um, if you've ever heard of Ray Lampy, Dr. Barbecue, I sent him some of the raw products and he, he did some test cooking and sent it back to me and says, Hey, do this versus this, do this instead of that. And then fast Eddie Marin with fast Eddie's, um, he did some test cooking with me. Um, guys that we used to see on the TV shows and thought that they were, they were it. Um, there I had them in my back pocket, and helped me do this competition test cooking. So it really helped me get my product out there. The growth of it. Um, I think it's just being true to myself, putting out a good product and more and more stores um, would call me. Um, I very seldom do I ever pick up a phone and call a store and ask them if they want to carry it. I would say almost everybody that's come on board with me is they've contacted me. God, that's a, that's a a beautiful thing, isn't it? I talk to so many people and they're like, yeah, man, every weekend I'm out at the stores and I'll go to a different store every weekend. And it's, been seven years now and I'm still going out to the stores and that's, that's phenomenal. That's so good. Well, it, it, there's several, I'm not going to say reasons cause I don't know the reason. Um, let's be real. But what I'd like to say is it has to do with having an item that is, that has a need. Okay. And I, I'm going to read this statement and it's everything that, um, that I've tried to teach my kid, my son, anytime you want to come up with something new, it's what weakness does it strengthen and how many people have that weakness? It's real simple. If you want to come out with a barbecue rub, how many people have a weakness of needing it? Okay. Mm. Well, let's be real. There's 10 million barbecue rubs out there in this world. You're just going to be one of those sitting there. What makes yours different? Okay. When I came out with the injections, there was one company. That was it, one. And they were going out because of family sickness. Um, So I kind of stepped in at the right time, um, and I put my spin on it from being in the meat world versus being the way that they were retailing it, and it was actually liked very well, uh, a lot better, and it just blew up from there. before long, we had that. We had the chicken products. We had it just blew up great. But I was always true to myself in being, as my slogan says, "Trust your butcher." I, I, I really, really put my heart and soul into that. And if it wasn't something that I could use, I didn't sell it. And that's the way I am right now. Is everything, all my products come around because of something or a process of how I cook, and that's how my stuff is. Mate, that's well said. That's a beautiful way of of phrasing that. Um, so, how many products are in the are in the lineup now? I have probably got about eighty different SKUs that we warehouse. Um, right here behind me is our warehouse, um, and there's I've got a lot of stuff that isn't even in retail packaging because we sell a lot of of our products to. Um, restaurants, um, food service establishments, stuff like that. And then there's a lot of things that we carry that not all the stores will handle. So they may have, like take our grilling oils. I've got five different types of grilling oils and you may only see two in your local store. So, but I mean, we've got like, I think nine, maybe nine different type, 10 different type injections. Wow. A lot of people only, only know of two or three. Yeah. 
Wow, that's phenomenal. That's incredible. Now, I, I just want to move on now. You were mentioning before about you you teach barbecue and you, you show everything step by step. Um, I saw on your website that you offer classes. Can you tell us a little bit about your classes? Those classes are actually an online class. We, we, we taped them live. They edited them, put them out. I got to watch them to make sure everything was still um, exactly the way it was and no steps were missing. Um, and it's through the barbecue champs Academy. Ah. When you purchase them. Yeah. When you purchase them, you've got them for 24 seven. You'll have them from now on. Um, you've got a, a private Facebook page that you can go in. That is for our, my, my stuff. Ask me questions. I answer them. You can shoot me a private message. Even I'll answer it. And we're in the process of doing something as an update for it, but that's not been out there yet, but, yeah, there it's it's broken down from the uh, box building, the trimming, the purchasing, the cooking, um, spices, seasoning, all the way into putting the meat in a box. Um, I mean, you name it, we go over it. We filmed for a few days getting this um, class put together. Wow! And so, which which different proteins are included in the class? Was it like a full KCBS comp style class? Yes, it's a full KCBS class. That's exactly what it is. And I believe it was uh, leg quarters. I cooked some chicken leg quarters for the for the class also, kind of of a backyard type taste. But we I did chicken thighs. I did spare ribs, uh, pork butts, and then the brisket. Oh, beautiful. Well worth checking out there. And the last point that I wanted to hit on was, like I can see your your beautiful microphone there. You have, of course, the Butcher Barbecue podcast. I do, and I fell in love with doing it. We've got mid fifties as far as episodes out there, and then last year, um, I'll I'll say it. It's it's my bad part. The business just got so busy. I did not have time to sit and do a lot of podcast. Uh, but my goal is to get back into it and do it because I love doing this right here, talking to people, interviewing them bringing out their, their fun stuff. So I, I absolutely enjoy the podcast. So yeah, I do want to get, get it active again. Yeah. Well, I've, I've listened to quite a few episodes. It's a great show. You've got a lot of insights that you bring to, to that podcasting uh, scenario. So it's a, it's well worth a listen and I recommend it to the audience. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. All righty. We're going to take a small break right now and we'll be back in just a moment. Alrighty, big uh, shout out to those of you who are rocking the Smoking Hot Confessions merch at the moment. We do have our beautiful uh, beanies and our hoodies and our t-shirts. We've got our tumblers available as well. They're over at smokinghotconfessions.com slash shop. They do feature our award-winning Hail Mary design as well. So we actually picked up our best barbecue apparel at uh, NBBQA in 2020, I think it was, with, uh, with Hail Mary. So you can Grab yourself a, a hoodie, a t-shirt, support the show. We we really appreciate it. And it really tickles me when I get out to the barbecue festivals and I do see you uh, running around in those shirts. So big, big props to those of you that have already got one. And if you would like to help us out and support the show, that's how that's one way that you can do that. Head on over to smokinghotconfessions.com slash shop and grab yourself some of that beautiful merch. You're listening to the internationally awarded Smoking Hot Confessions podcast with massive barbecue nerd, Ben Arnott. All righty, now this is the third segment of our show, David. This is where our, our guests get to share some wisdom, share some knowledge, and basically give a lesson to our viewers and listeners. So given your extensive background in competition barbecue, uh, you've decided today to uh, to talk to the people that are looking at getting into competition barbecue because we've we're, here in Australia and in the States as well, we're starting to see a changing of the guard. Some of the some of the longer serving teams are, are fading out and some of the, we've got a new crop of uh, competitors coming through. So I'm going to throw it over to you. I'm going to be quiet now and just uh, take some notes and you're going to share some wisdom about getting started in competition barbecue. Well, thank you. First off, Ben, I want to say I appreciate all your listeners, um, and I really appreciate the customers of Butcher Barbecue. And that being said, there is more and more people that that's probably the number one question I get. How do I get into this? Um, How do I start? How do I know what to do in a competition? That's the biggest thing. The best thing I can say is start at home, start cooking at home. 
and take notes. That's the biggest thing I can tell you. Write down everything. And I mean everything. Take notes on the weather outside, the wind. If you your your smoker is going to change, um, if you've got the firebox going one way and the flute going the other way, um, what you're putting on it, um, the size of the meat that you're going to test cook. Um, and I mean, weigh it out, take notes. If you can take pictures on a smartphone, take pictures. Um, let's just start with brisket. If you've got a 15 pound brisket and you trim it down to nine pounds, it's going to cook different than if you left it at 15 pounds, but take notes, how thick, how wide, um, the circumference, where you put it on the grate in your cooker makes a huge difference. Um, if you're putting it on the left side, the right side, the front, the back, and it all changes with the airflow. Airflow is the important thing inside your chamber. If you don't understand how to um, check the airflow in your own cooker, um, are you aware when I say the biscuit test, Ben, do you know what I mean when I say the biscuit test? I do, yes, but uh, you can explain that for the okay. audience if you'd like. All right, all right. Take and make up some biscuits. Here in the States, we got those cheap biscuits. We call them pop biscuits. They come in a roll in a grocery store. Lay them all over the grate on your cooker, okay? And have your fire already going. Set it at the temp that you think it should be. Do that. And then um, go back and look at them in five minutes. Go back and look at them in 10 minutes. The, the hotter part of you, the hottest part of your grate, they're going to brown very quick and start charring. The cooler part's going to, it's going to take longer to get the biscuits done. So stay up with your biscuits and find out where it is. And what that does, that makes you a pit master. Because then when you get to a contest and mother nature, hap mother nature happens, and let's say things are falling behind. Well, if you remember your biscuit test, you can say, hey, the backside on the left in the back corner was my hottest spot. I got to get this pork butt caught up to my timing and my temperatures. So place it over there, get it in the hot spot so it can catch up so that your rest of your process doesn't change. And every step you make changes your outcome. It changes your time, your temperatures, when things are being cooked, how, how the temperature is. Anyway, let's get back to what you can do. Um, the type of wood, write notes, take, take notes. Um, how much wood you put on it, the wood chips you put on it, the time you put on it, write down your cook. If you want to start at nine o'clock in the morning, write down 9 a.m. Okay. I end at 9 30. I opened it up and rotated it. Put down 9 30, rotate. 9 45, opened up and spritzed. Okay. 10 o'clock, I did this or 11. Whatever it is, you write down the time and everything of every piece of meat for your test. Now, before you go to a contest, sit down and do a complete test cook with all of it because you opened up that smoker maybe four or five times to cook the pork butts, but you might have only opened that door up twice to do your ribs. Opening it up for your pork butts is going to change your ribs because you've opened and closed it more. Your chicken, your brisket, everything changes. And so while you're test cooking, Keep in mind where you put it on your grate, especially like an offset. If you can have your favorite spot right there in the middle of, the, uh, of it, well, you can't put all four meats right there at the same time. So you need to find other spots to cook in your smoker for different meats. Take notes and make notes of where it cooks better, where it didn't cook more. So while you're taking those notes, combine the notes sitting in front of the fridge or your, your TV one time. Combine them all on a graph. Um, that's what I do is I, I will took like if say noon is my turn in for chicken, I will back it up. Um, I want to sauce my chicken at 1145. Um, and then I want to have it, you see what I'm backstage it all the way through the cook to where if it's going to go on at nine o'clock, do I got three things I need to do at nine o'clock all at the same time? Do I need to wrap my brisket? Do I need to put the chicken on? Do I need to be, see what I'm saying? Make your notes so that you can compile them all together, put them on an Excel spreadsheet and just literally see what overlaps. You may have to change something 10 minutes, 
but it's very important to have notes and take care of that. Now, also keep notes for everything you had to go back in your garage for, everything you had to go back in the house for. <laughs> I knew you can't do that at a contest. So if you need an extra roll of paper towels or more gloves or, and then just do the opposite. Also, when you're finished up and you're done and you're like, I never used all this stuff. Hey, kick it out. Don't haul it to the contest and take the back of your truck heaped all the way up. If you don't use it, you don't use it. Okay. Don't take it. You don't need 750 feet of extension cords. Why? Okay. But do a cook at home exactly like a contest. If your contest is going to have, let's say, 11 o'clock for the first turn in, that means you're going to be cooking through the night generally, either for your big meats or something. So at home, do the same thing because when you get to a contest, you may not realize you need some lights maybe underneath your easy up, something you might not have thought of. Or if the wind is blowing, I always had paper towels. Well, now they're blowing all over everything. I need some way to keep my paper towels from blowing overnight. Um, just the littlest little things, but take notes. That's the biggest thing I could tell you. And the reason I say that is even now, it's 14 years later, 15 years later. For us, I still go back and look at those notes because I'll get a brainstorm and go, I used to do this. How did I do that? Well, I'm not having to burn a lot more meat. I can go back to my notes and I can see exactly how I used to do something. And that fits into my program now. So it's really great to have that. Right. So you got like a giant uh, library of, uh, of past uh, Pitmaster logbooks. Oh, absolutely. I do. I've got spiral notebooks, the spiral notebook stuff, just full of stuff. Every major contest we've cooked at, if they've changed the timeline, I've got it. And the, there's certain things that I'll even take notes. I'll like I say, I'll take a picture of the timeline, have it on my phone. Um, I'll take it, send it to my brother just in case we get somewhere and, and we don't lose it because it's in our trailer. But if you get somewhere, like if you're traveling, like I'll fly to a contest sometimes. Um, and I say, I drop my phone in the water and I have to go get a new phone. He could text me the timeline. He's got it himself. So I always have a backup somewhere that's available. Excellent. Excellent. Look, those are fantastic words of wisdom, David. Thank you so much. Um, I think it's probably a good time for us to start closing out the episode. So I'll get you to give some shout outs, some praise, some thank yous to people that have helped you out along the way and tell everybody where they can follow you on the, uh, on the interwebs. Hey, you bet. I appreciate it. First and foremost, I would say thank you to my wife, my family, my mom, dad. Um, it's a family thing for me. Uh, my brother works for me here at the warehouse. My son runs the restaurant. Um, so it's a great big family barbecue thing. Um, I don't actually bring on sponsors because I'm, I'm just actually trying to just take care of butcher barbecue, but I do cook. And the very first smoker I ever took to a contest, I still cook on. And it's those cook shacks, uh, the fast eddies, the FEC 100s, the upright type. I still cook on those right there. That's what I cook on. Um, and I've added the pellet grill and I've added a drum, but most all my cooks done on those pellet grills. Um, so that's, that's really it guys. That's it. Wow. So good, mate. So good. Look, thanks so much for your time. I really appreciate it. I know you're a busy, busy man. So I really, uh, and, and I'm sure that my audience is, it's very appreciative of the time and the wisdom that you've shared with us as well. So thank you very much. And I look forward to seeing you again soon. Hey, you bet. Maybe sometime I can come down there and cook with you. Mate, I would love that so much. Yeah. All right. Ben, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. And there you have it, family. That was the one and only David Bosca from Butcher Barbecue. And there you go. I actually pronounced it properly that time as well. So I get some extra points for that one. So uh, what a competitor. What a legend. He, you know, started in 2006, got his first GC in 2007 and opened a business by the end of 2007. I think he said he started selling his first products. And the rest of it, as they say, is history. Such a huge, uh, huge wealth of knowledge there that he was able to share with us today so that was a huge privilege for us as well and I really appreciate what he was able to share with us I really like that bit about the pit master's logbook the the notebooks definitely tips worth worth taking note of there ah 
I didn't even realize I just made a pun. All right, very good. So there you have it, folks. David Bosker, very appreciative of his time. And if you would like to help out the show, head on over to smokinghotconfessions.com slash shop. Grab yourself some of our merch, T-shirts, hoodies, beanies. We've got our tumblers. There's even a few e-books over there as well. So make sure you head on over there, check that out. We would really appreciate it. Now that's all the time we have for today. So until next time, take care of each other and keep on queuing. Thanks for listening to the Smoking Hot Confessions podcast. Head on over to smokinghotconfessions.com for recipes, tips, and Ben's own confessions. <laughs>